Good morning, church. It's good to see every one of you. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, how many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord? It says in a verse from Psalms, he, David said, I was glad when they told me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I'm glad. This is where we, we find him. This is where we see him. So if you want to just stand up with me, we're going to start worship. Let's just give him all of our praise. Let's be glad today. We're, we're here. We're in the presence of our God. Let's just give him all our attention, all our worship. Let's do it. God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be, cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God he holds the victory, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is shining in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise Oh 
glorious I run inside your throne And before you I'll bow The very stone, the doors fling wide I see glorious I run inside Sweet.
church, I want to take a moment to pray together. We just got uh, a word, a prayer request. There's a young family, uh, Alice and Joshua. They they got um, notified or they found out that they, they just lost their, their newborn. And we believe victory belongs to Jesus, but I want to take a moment to mourn with those who mourn and just to pray for this young family, um, that the Lord would give them peace and comfort. Um, so church, let's just pray together. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, I pray for, for this young family. God, I, I, I thank you for the day that this young family could be reunited with their child. I thank you for the day where, where they all get to see each other once again. But God, I pray right now, right now you fill them. You fill this, this, this young couple with such a, such a peace, such a comfort something that would confuse any doctor, any nurse, any, any surrounding family member, that, that when, when the world would say you should be angry, you should be frustrated, that they, they know you are a God who is in control, you know that you are a God that provides more abundantly than we can ask, think, or imagine. God, I pray for this young couple, Lord. And God, we as a church unite in, in, in prayer and in, in request that you would fill this family with such a peace, such a comfort, such a joy, Lord. God, we know that you are victorious over death. You are victorious o over all, Lord God, and we rejoice in the day that this family could be re reunited. Amen. Worship team, thank you. Church, thank you. Um, this, is, this is why we gather. It's not just for the rosy moments, not just for all the all the ups, it's, it's for, for these moments as well. Jesus is the, the true comforter. You can greet a neighbor, you could take a seat. Oh man. Man. Well, I could say this, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Victory does belong to Jesus. Come on, come on. Um, I wanna start off by, by reading a scripture. Um, it's Luke chapter 12, verse 22. This is Jesus speaking. He says, and he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, could add a single hour of span to his life? If then you're not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, neither they toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, but if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Yeah. Oh, you of little faith. You do not seek to what you are to eat, where you, for what you are to eat or what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added unto you. Any newlyweds, like recently, last six months? So something, something funny happens when you get married. Anytime you visit your like parents after, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You come, you visit your parents, you come empty-handed, and next thing you know, you're walking out with like bags of groceries and all, every single supply. You have like a toolkit and like all these, all these different things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember me and Joanna, when uh, we, got we got married 2018. We're actually coming up on three years in the 16th, so four more days. Um, super exciting. 
Um, but I remember we were recently married. It was still uh, 2019, and um, we visited my parents. And my parents grow all sorts of random things in their backyard, as parents do. And um, we, we came in. We were just visiting, just saying hi, just stopping by. And we left with just bags of kale. Um, <laughs> and it's just me and Joanna, uh, you know, living together. Like, what are we supposed to do with, like, like five bushels of kale? But we're, you're not going to say no to, to this, this offer from the parents. And so we're like, okay, um, we're going to start giving this away to all of our healthy friends. Um, uh, and we, ha we had some, some, some healthy friends at the time that were moving. This is actually just a, a quick story about them. And we, uh, they're like, hey, come over. Like, we're going to be moving. We're going to do a little garage sale. Like, feel free to stop by first. And I'm like, great, we'll bring you some kale. Um, so we come there with our, with our uh, bushels of kale. We come in, and th there's like garage sales, and then there's like what these people had going on. These are like well-off folk. Um, <laughs> like it's something I've, I've never seen before. We step into their garage. It's still closed at this time. We have insider early access as friends. And there is just like a closet arrangement. Like, you know, like you walk into fancy stores and like clothes have their like spacing in between them. It's not like a, like a clump together, but it's like, a, it's like an experience. This was this, these people's garage. Um, so we walk in there, they have all their like clothes arranged. They have all these like, like duffel bags and, and all these different things. And they're like, you could choose. Or like, like, what do you mean? What do you mean, like how much? Like, no, like go ahead. Like take whatever you want. And we're like, oh, okay. And then like, we're like kind of hesitant, kind of like, all right, this is a little bit, this is a little weird. Um, but they're, they just start like handing me stuff. Like, like grab, I'm literally wearing the guy's jeans right now. Um, he, just, he just picks up the pair of jeans and he's like, here, like, like these would look great on you. Like, actually, these are his shoes too. <laughs> I didn't even, no, yeah, he's like, he's like, these shoes would, would look great. Um, uh, the, the girl starts handing some things to Joanna, start handing us all this stuff and we're like, like, how, okay, like, like how much do you want to spend? They're like, no, this is, this is fine, just take it, take it all. And we're like, well, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is a bit much. Like, I don't need like eight pairs of jeans and four duffel bags. So what do I start doing? I start calling my friends. I start FaceTiming, I'm like, hey, what's your pant size? Like, <laughs> um, so like all my friends now have like jeans and backpacks and uh, all this good stuff. And, um, I, I, like another thing that started happening, the guy started like going to his actual closet, not the stuff that he had he had in the garage sale. He's like, this this jacket would look great on you, and I'm just I'm just like blown away, blown away uh, by entering the house of a generous person. Um, I, I I remember there was this this other time I attended one of the first weddings ever. Um, not, not one of the first weddings ever in history, but one of the first weddings I attended. Um, it was like one of, those, one of those weddings that you don't really know the people, but you're invited just because your parents are invited. Um, and uh, I was like maybe 13 years old, and I'm there with my brothers and my siblings. And at, in my parents' household, like sugary drinks weren't a big thing. Like, we're never buying soda, we're never doing stuff like that. If we were, it's those, like, frozen uh, cans of, like, juice that you put into water. If anybody, it doesn't matter. Anyways, we come to this wedding, um, and there's Martinelli's on every single, every single table. And we, we're there a little early, and me and my brothers are like, <laughs> like, we, we don't know this couple, we don't really care. So it's just a Martinelli's party for us. And we start, we start like sneaking, like I'm serious. We start sneaking to other tables, grabbing the Martinelli's and just, just hoarding them on, on our, our table. And so when people like come, go get their food, they come back, they have nothing to drink and we're just like, have it like literally eight bottles under the table for no reason. Like there's, there's this is not necessary. Now it's, it's kind of funny to think about, but you look probably absolutely ridiculous when 
in the, in the back, in the kitchen, they're just bringing out more racks and more rows of Martinelli's, and you're like, oh. <laughs> Something happens when you live out of a position of scarcity versus abundance, versus when there's, <laughs> there is a limited amount, and there is only a limited amount for me, versus, whoa, there's enough for everyone. At the wedding, it, you know, it, there's, there's a limited amount of, of, of Martinelli's, but in this generous person's household, I'm calling my friends. I'm like, this is more than enough. This is more than, than I would ever need. Jesus says he comes to give life and life more abundant. And this is, this is deeper than, than physical things, than Martinelli's bottles or pairs of jeans. This is a position of the heart. Church, I know we are, we are blessed for what, what is about to come. We have an opportunity right in front of us, but I, I could tell you just, in, just in, in the conversations that are happening that this, this church is on a very special pathway. And one of the things kind of recently what, what has happened with the, with the group that went on missions to Africa, our church is a church that is operating out of abundance from a spiritual place and a financial place. This is a household that has more than enough. Now, I'm not talking about like pennies. I'm talking about spiritual position. In church, when, when we begin to operate out of, a, out of a place where it says, God, I'm in your house, I'm your child, I will, I will operate out of a position that is more than enough, our giving changes. Our, our giving changes. We are not hoarding. We are not, are not uh, coming together, trying to hold everything together, gathering every single Martinelli's bottle. But we're able to give and give freely, give with open hands. There's a, there's a verse, I think it's in the message translation. It's one of my favorite verses on this topic. It says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, while the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I want to be a church that impacts the world. I mean, we, we start here. We start in federal way, but we, we have an opportunity to impact Africa and missions and go out unto all nations in preaching the gospel. We're not worried about if we get our slice of the pie. We know that our God, our Father, has created the pie. And if we need a bigger pie... He'll make a bigger pie. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. The table is big enough. There is room for you. There is space for you. We're in the house of a good, good father. And there's enough on the table for, for you, for any newcomer walking in the door. If there are those with, with financial needs, I want to encourage you to, to, to speak to someone at, at the info booth, speak to someone in this church, that there, there is more than enough for you. We are well taken care of. We know who our God is. Yes. I just want to end with this one thought. I don't, I don't see him today, but those of you who know Mark Morgan, I've, I, I sat down, uh, first time I'm ever getting coffee with him, and I'm like, hey, like, I'll, I'll pay. He's like, no, no, I'll pay. He's like, my dad's, a, I, he's like, I'm a trust fund child. <laughs> and I was like, like when you first meet someone, you don't really get, like get the humor. You're, I was like, whoa, like your dad's really rich. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about his heavenly father. Church, uh, I want to encourage you to give and give generously. Um, we, we, we have a, a very special church that is able to do very special things. Ushers, if you guys could come forward. Uh, one, one or two quick announcements. I know um, next Saturday is men's breakfast. You guys excited for that? And then um, September 26th, we'll be having baby dedication. So if you want to announce uh, a new baby, go ahead and head over to the info booth, and um, we'll get you signed up for that. Thank you. Welcome to City Hill Church. If this is your first time, we want you to feel right at home. Please stop by the info table so that we can connect with you and so we can treat you to a cup of coffee. Let's take a few minutes to hear our upcoming events.
Hi friends, if you are ages 5 to 10 and love to sing for God, I would like to invite you to join our church kids choir. First rehearsal is starting September 13th at 6.50 p.m. Parents, please register your kids beforehand. Visit our church app or find us on Instagram. City Hill men, we are so excited to invite you to men's breakfast that's going to be taking place on September 18th here at this building at 8.30 a.m. Do not miss out. We have an amazing special word prepared just for you. Delicious food and a great time of fellowship and worship our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do not miss out. Invite your friends. We will see you there. That's all the announcements that we have for you today. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media. You can find more resources by downloading our app. Thank you again for joining us here at City Hill. Amen. Come on. God is good. Amen. That was a good word. Is that almost a full sermon right there? I was like, might, have, <laughs> might as well just go back into worship. But um, very true, very good, very impactful. When a, uh, when a person is generous, when a people become generous, when a church is generous, because that truly changes, impacts, and transforms lives. Because ultimately, the way that our life was ever changed, the way that we became who we are is because of a God who's generous. If it wasn't for a God who gave, we would not be where we're at. If it wasn't a God who gave life, then we wouldn't be alive. If it wasn't for a God who gave breath, then we wouldn't be breathing today. If it wasn't a God who gave his son, then we wouldn't have life eternal. And so the reason why we are generous is because of the God who gives and who is generous. Amen? Amen. Um, let's just jump into it because I didn't really figure out a way to intro this sermon, to be honest. But let's jump into it. John chapter 18, verse 37. And 38. John chapter 18, verse 37 and 38. This is a moment where Jesus is brought over to Pilate and he's going to be crucified. This is before he gets crucified and he's brought by the Sadducees and the, and the priests and they've brought him over um, in order to bring him um, into the hands of Pilate in order for Pilate to execute his judgment over Jesus and to send him over to be crucified. Because in those days, in that time, the Jews, they were not allowed to commit capital punishment. That was not in their authority because they were ruled by Rome. The only people who could commit someone to capital punishment would be the Romans. And so now the Jews are in this kind of precarious situation where they want to get rid of Jesus because they hate Jesus for what he's doing, who he is. But they can't kill him because they're not allowed to. And so what they need to do is they need to convince the leader of that region, which is Pilate, they need to convince him in this moment in order for him to decide and say, Jesus, you must die. So they've brought him to Jesus and they brought all these accusations against Jesus. They've brought all these lies against Jesus and they've said, this is who Jesus is. This is what he has said. This is who he has proclaimed to be, a, rebel, a rebellious person against Caesar, against Rome, against your throne, Pilate. This is who he is. And so now Jesus is speaking to Jesus and he says, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered him, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. So in this moment, Pilate is interrogating Jesus before he decides because it's up to Pilate to decide whether or not Jesus gets crucified. And so he's speaking to Jesus and he's asking him, he's saying, are you this king? Are you the king that they're talking about? Are you really this rebel that they're, that they're proclaiming you to be? And Jesus answers him and it's kind of an interesting answer to be honest, but Jesus had always had pretty interesting answers if you read in the scripture because Jesus knows what's going on in this moment even. He sees the heart of man and he sees the heart of Pilate and so he answers him that, hey, you're saying I'm the king, but I'm, I'm not just the king. That's not what I came here to do. I came here to proclaim a truth deeper than just the king because the, the reason why 
Pilate was asking this question, the reason why he was so confused with what was going on, in reality, he really was confused about what the truth was. The bringing of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus was such a, uh, a moment of deep politics, in a way. Because the leaders of the time, the Sadducees and the priests of the Jewish, the Jewish leaders of the time, they didn't like Jesus. So they're bringing up Jesus in order for him to get crucified. And they're trying their best. They're throwing all that they have at him. Um, and they want to convince Pilate in order for Pilate to decide to crucify Jesus. Pilate is a governor. He's a, he, what they would call a perfect over the region of Judea. He was placed there and established there by Caesar. And he's overseeing this region uh, in the Middle East, which had historically been a place that was really unruly. It was a place that was hard to oversee. Uh, many times there would be different rebellions. There would be different people who would come up, different messiahs even, different people who would want to reestablish the kingdom of David, different men who would call themselves the king of the Jews, and they would come up and it was Pilate's job in order for those people not to exist because that would disturb the stability of the Roman Empire. Pilate was placed there in order to oversee, in order to oversee this region, in order to make sure that the stability of this region remained as it should be. He was placed there by Caesar, and now before him stands this person who the priests and the Sadducees are saying is a direct threat to Caesar himself. And so Pilate is asking the question, what is the truth? Because he's hearing all these lies coming from the Sadducees. He knows that they're lying to him. It's funny because if you read what they, what they even did, they brought Jesus to the house of Pilate, but they themselves did not want to even walk inside it because they knew that tomorrow's Passover, they can't defile themselves by standing in the place of the Gentiles. So they're saying, here, Pilate, do our dirty work for us. This man deserves to die. Take him away. And now they brought him to the feet of Pilate. They brought him before him, and Pilate has to make a decision about what to do with Jesus. And he asked this valid question, what is truth? What is truth? All of a sudden, there stands this man before him. If for one second you guys could imagine what it is like to be Pilate, there stands a man before you who, unlike many of the other rebels who had come, unlike many of the others who had proclaimed to be king of the Jews and king of this region and have brought up armies and brought up people to stand and fight and you have squashed their battles, you have squashed the rebellions, but here stands a man who's different. He's not like the rest. He's not like those uh, priests, so-called priests and Sadducees and holy men standing outside and yelling for his death. He's not like them. He's different. You can tell. You can tell that his way of speaking, his way of doing things is different than those who have come before him. And so you ask him, or you ask him and you say, are you a king? And he replies, I am a king, but not of a kingdom like yours. Because your kingdom is a kingdom that comes with destruction. Your kingdom is one that comes with blood, with sweat, with tears. Your kingdom is one of your own ambitions, of your own achievements. Your kingdom is one of your own successes and your own failures. Your kingdom is one that you are so desperately trying to hold on to. Your kingdom is one that you're so afraid will be taken away from you. You're fighting hard, you're fighting mad in order to keep your grasp on this kingdom that you're holding here in this land of Judea. You think you're a king, but you're a king. your kingdom is crumbling. I'm a king, but I'm a king from a different place, from a different kind of kingdom. And so now you're looking at this man who's standing before you, a man unlike any other that you have ever met. You see that he doesn't speak the lies that are being spoken by so many around you. You see that he doesn't speak in the untruth that even you have believed yourself because you continue to lie to yourself about your own kingdom and your own ways and what is good for you. But you hear this man speak to you. 
And what this man says is he says, I'm not here to lie to you, Pilate. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm here to tell you the truth and only the truth. If only you would listen to me, Pilate. If only you would hear the words that I'm saying to you right now. My kingdom is greater than any kingdom that has ever been and it has yet to come. Pilate, yes, you're a, kingdom, you're a king of this land in Judea. You're a king over this place, but you're just a puppet controlled by the powers above and the powers below. Pilate, all that's happening to you right now is you're trying to fulfill the will of Caesar and you're trying to make sure that the people that you're overseeing are happy. You do not see that you're just controlled by that which is your own kingdom. What is the truth, you might think? What is the truth is what Pilate asks in this moment. Realizing that the man in front of you isn't a liar. He's not one who has come to trick you. He's not some kind of rebel. He's not some kind of hack. He's not someone who is faking or tricking his way into popularity or is faking or tricking his way into some kind of rulership. He's, that's not who he is. He's not a fake man. You can see that this man is innocent and is not guilty of all the things that are being said against him. You've seen many that have come before him, but this man is different. This man is different than all those before him. This man is different than those who cry for his death. This man is innocent. What is the truth, you might ask? Out of all the lies that you've heard so far, out of all the lies that you may have told yourself, what is the truth? Pilate asks Jesus. What is truth? In the next chapter, we see that he enters his headquarters again and says to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, will you speak to me? Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would not have, you would not have no authority. You would, not, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, who, it is he who delivered me over into you has greater sin. Who are you, Jesus, Pilate asks. Who are you? Do you see how Pilate is getting so near to realizing who Jesus is in this moment? Because for Pilate, who has been this, this ruler over this region, who has been overseeing these people, and it's not an easy people to oversee. You can ask Moses. And so he's over here, overseeing this region full of rebellions, full of troubles, a place that's probably a curse to any governor. When he got the assignment, when, his, when Caesar's like, hey, Pilate, you're going to Judea, he's like, for real? Are you serious? And so he's here, he's seen all the lies, he's seen everything that has happened in this region, he's seen the people who have tried to kill him, the people who have tried to go against him, the people who have tried to manipulate him, and the people who are outside the door right now trying to manipulate him in order to kill this innocent man. He's talking to this man and he realizes this man is different. For some reason this man is different, he's not like any other man. And so he says to him, who are you? Another question, where are you from? He asks these questions, but for some reason, he doesn't seem to want to listen to the answer. He says, Jesus, what is the truth? He says, Jesus, where are you from? And then he begins to talk about himself. Jesus, don't you understand that it is in my power, in my authority, in order for, in order for you to live or die today? Jesus, don't you understand that it's up to me whether or not you're going to be crucified today? And Jesus replies to him. He says, Pilate, you don't understand. 
All power, all authority that you have right now has been given to you from above. It has been given to you from Caesar, actually. But Pilate, you don't understand that my power, unlike your power, which comes from Caesar, my power comes from further above than that. It comes from my Father in heaven. Now in this moment, we see Pilate is being challenged. He's looking at this man, which he thinks he has all authority over. He's looking at this man who he thinks is king of the Jews. But in reality, he's looking at a man who's king of kings. The king of Judea is standing before the king of kings. And in this moment, the king of Judea has an option before him. Whether or not to bow to the king of kings and submit to him. And to truly listen and hear what it is that this king of kings is trying to say to him. Or to dismiss him and send him to the crucifixion. In this moment, we see that Pilate is so close. He's so close to encountering who Jesus is. He's so close to seeing who this man who is so different, unlike any other is. But in this moment, we see that Pilate decides to walk out. He asks the question, he says, Jesus, what is truth? What is the truth, Jesus? I wonder how many times we can ask ourselves that because the truth is hard to come by sometimes. There's so many lies in the world. There's so many different things that people say to us. There's so many different things that we believe. Sometimes you believe something is so true and then you realize, well, that wasn't really the, the case, was it? Sometimes we're so convinced of our own beliefs or our own opinions, but then all of a sudden they get overturned. We see examples of this all the time. The truth is hard to come by. And so Pilate is looking Jesus in the face and asking him, what is the truth? Because that's a true, deep, yearning question in his heart. He realizes he's being lied to all around him. How often is it that we're being lied to all around us? Sometimes we love to hear when people tell us that people are lying to us because that makes us feel like we're victims of some sort. But sometimes it's hard to accept the fact that we lie to ourselves more often than anybody else. What are the lies that we're believing in and are we truly looking for the truth? Because in this moment, Pilate asks the question, but he doesn't want to see it. He doesn't want to hear it. He understands that the truth is a lot harder than, might be a lot harder to take than just living in a lie that he already lives in. What ends up happening to Pilate in that moment when he asks Jesus what is the truth, he steps out, he goes back out to the Jews and he says, hey, this man is innocent, but I guess we'll do what you want. Because he's afraid of what's gonna happen if the rebellion starts, right? If the rebellion starts, if the people rile up against what he's doing, what's gonna happen? Caesar's gonna come, he's gonna see that, hey, Pilate, you're not doing your job, get out of here. So instead of waiting for an answer from Jesus, he steps out. If only he had stayed and listened because literally the way, the truth, and the life is standing right before him. But he doesn't want to wait. He doesn't want to hear. He doesn't want to listen. And he sends Jesus away. What ends up happening to Pilate in the future is that he continues to rule over Judea and historically, we see that there comes a time where his rulership over this region, it becomes so difficult that he begins to implement things. And he begins to be a crueler and crueler leader to a point where he gets taken back to Rome and gets put on trial and ends up having to kill himself as a punishment for what he's doing in this land. The kingdom that he was so desperately holding on to got taken out of his hands in the way that he had not ever imagined it would have happened. This man was standing right before Jesus, right before the truth, before the king of kings, and he did not receive him. He had an opportunity in this moment, 
in this time in order to bow before the king of kings and acknowledge him as who he is, but he decided not to. He decided to hold on to his own kingdom. He decided to hold on to what he had, and as a result, he lost everything. How many times can we relate to this man, Pilate? Because as many stories in the scripture, the story resembles us in many ways. How many times are we so willing to hold on to what we have here on earth? The small little empire that we have built, the small little kingdom that we want for ourselves. How many times are we willing to listen to the lies that are being fed to us rather than standing before the king of kings and bowing down to him before the one who is truth and giving everything into his hands? How many times are we more willing to remain king of a, a king of a petty kingdom rather than giving and submitting into the hands of the king of the universe? Pilate had an opportunity in that moment, and he was so close. He was so close to submit. He was asking all the right questions, but sadly, he wasn't listening. Sadly, he did not want to hear it. What my message to you guys today is, to the church today is, is while we ask these questions, should we also listen and hear the answer that comes from Jesus? Because Jesus is here once again, here in this place. The King of kings, the Lord of lords is here in this place, and he wants you to come to him and acknowledge him as the king of your life. Not just the king of kings, not just the Lord of lords, not just the one who has created all things, but the king of your life personally. The Lord over who you are personally. The Lord who rules and reigns in every single day of your life. That's who Jesus was. That's the king who was standing before Pilate in that moment. And you can imagine the picture there, right? There's a king of Judea standing, a ruler, and before him stands the king of the universe. And yet this king of Judea looks at this king of the universe and thinks, I have control over you. I have authority over you. I can do what I want. I decide whether you live or die today. But the king of the universe replies, says, no, Pilate, no. You don't understand. You don't realize who you're speaking to in this moment. You don't know the authority which you have. It's only been given to you by me. And so many times in our lives, we take God in the position in our own life, and we look at him and we think, God, I'm the ruler of my kingdom. I'm the one who reigns in my life. I'm the one who rules there. But the reality is, is that we're not. The reality is that we're not. In the same way that Pilate was just a puppet, in the plans of all those around him, sometimes our life begins to puppet master us. And we're just dragged by the strings of life. And it's only when we submit to the King of Kings, only when we submit to the Lord of Lords, when we realize that the true control that we so desperately want is not what we need, but when we give it unto him and we allow him to reign in our lives. If I could have the worship team join me, I'm going to be closing here with these final thoughts. When Pilate stood before the king of kings and he had an opportunity, he had that moment to receive this king, to acknowledge him for who he is. When Pilate had this moment in order to see that this king, this man who was so different than anybody else, This king that he called the king of the Jews was truly the king of the universe. Pilate had that moment before him, but he rejected it. Pilate had that moment before him, and he denied it. He stepped out. He didn't want to hear what the king of kings was going to say. In the same way, we have these moments every single day in our lives, whether or not to submit to the king of kings or whether to live as our own kings and rulers in our life whether or not to submit to who he is, to the truth that he proclaims, because that's what he said, I have come to proclaim a truth. The truth was that he had come 
in order to establish this new kingdom, a kingdom of life, not of death, a kingdom that conquers sin. And when we submit to his kingdom, when we submit to his rulership, when we submit to his authority, we live in that nature, in that new kingdom, conquering sin and death. But when we begin to rule, when we think that we are the kings of our lives, when we think that we are the ones who reign, when we deny the truth that Christ speaks to us, that's when we live in the destruction, that's when we live in death and sin. And today my message is pretty simple. Receive him as king over your life. Make him Lord in your life. Make him the one who rules in your day to day. Make him the one who reigns in every single moment that you live. This isn't a word for just people who do not know him. This is a word for every single person, for every single Christian. Because sometimes we forget about who the Lord of our life is. Sometimes we live as though we do not even know him. Sometimes we live like as though we do not even have him in our lives. But the important thing is to realize that he is Lord. And when he is Lord, that means he is there over everything. That means we submit every single part. Not just the Sunday morning. Not just two hours on a Sunday. Or on a Friday or on a Wednesday. Not just at the prayer services. Not just when we spend time reading the word, but every single moment, every single day of our lives should be submitted to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every single moment of our lives should be given unto him and we should realize that he is the one who rules and reigns. We can either be like Pilate with Jesus standing right in front of us and send him away or we can truly acknowledge for who he is, the king of everything, including our lives. You guys want to stand with me? Jesus. Jesus, you are king. You are Lord. And we come to bow before you, Jesus. We come to bow before you. We acknowledge you as the king, as the Lord, as the ruler over each one of us. And I pray, Jesus, help us to honor you in this moment, Lord. Help us to give you glory in our lives, Lord Jesus. Let us live for your kingdom. Live for your glory, Lord Jesus. Let us not live as rulers over what we have, trying to hold on to what we have trying to grasp onto this small, petty kingdom that we might have. But Lord, let us give it all up to the true king, to the true Lord of lords, knowing that you deserve our lives. You deserve the glory. You deserve the praise. We honor you, Jesus, in this place. We honor who you are in this place. We praise you, Jesus, and we give you glory. We give you glory. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be in this place. Thank you for allowing us to be in your presence, in your kingdom. God, we are grateful. We are grateful to serve you. It is a joy, it is an honor, it is a privilege to be in your kingdom, God. Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for the love that you've given to us. Amen. Church, happy Sunday. You can give a, a shout of joy to the Lord. That first one, was, there we go. Hallelujah. It's a, it's a privilege and a blessing to serve the Lord. You are a royal priest. You are children of God. Go and walk out out of these buildings and, and bring the temple of Jesus into your rooms, into your Sunday gatherings. Have an amazing day. Amen.